crack. What we're back, baby. That's right. Oh, man, I'm super excited for this week because we have the one and only Fiona Renee from CBS's hit show, Tracker, with Justin Hartley on the show this week. Yes, and we're going to talk all about that with her, and we talk about her uh, enjoyment and short time on Fire Country, which that was really fun. But, uh, yeah, it, man, what an amazing interview. She just gets real deep with us about life and, and, and how she gets about and all the stuff she deals with and then she lightens it up and we have a lot of fun talking about all kinds of fun stuff with her career and man it's the one you don't want to miss I completely agree and I mean it's really like a couple of old friends just sitting back on the couch catching up that's really what it seemed like I mean she was so humble and so welcoming and to be able to have that type of guest on our show is something that we strive for every single week and that's what we pride ourselves on here at ITCAP Podcast for as well to be able to be a welcoming environment for people to come on because we're not that TMZ programming. No. We are just here to have a conversation. You know, this is their time to uplift themselves or uplift whatever they want to talk about. And that's what we're here for. But man, oh man, I'm super excited for this interview. I'm excited for y'all to listen to it. But that's later on in the show. Now, let's get a little crazy. Hello, everyone. So you want to start a podcast but have no idea where to start? Well, Crazy Ant Media is here to help you. We want to assist you finding your VFE. What's VFE, you ask? Well, that is your voice, your format, and your equipment. These are the three biggest essentials you need to start your podcast. All those hours watching nonstop YouTube videos or all those random website links, those are done. Just hop on a Zoom call with us and we'll talk about everything you need to know to create your own podcast and find your voice. Plus, we will send you home with a 12-page packet over everything we just discussed. It's very in-depth. It is definitely a must-need while trying to start your first podcast. Contact us at info at crazyantmedia.com today so that you can start finding your podcast voice for tomorrow. What's up, guys? Oh, my goodness, man. Episode 256. Woo! And we are back. Your host with the most, myself, J-Lo Fantastic, and the one and only Mao. What's up? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. It's going to be a great freaking show. But, of course, before teasing the rest of the show, be sure to leave a rating on this podcast. Comment below and tell us what you actually think about this show. Because if you don't know, leaving a rating on this podcast helps more people see this podcast, especially those who enjoy entertainment news. But especially those who are trying to break into the entertainment industry. This podcast is all about giving you the recent news that is coming out of the entertainment industry. It's also about having conversations with celebrity guests that are on your favorite hit TV show, just so that you can know their background and how they got started in the industry. And then, of course, we like to have a little fun with top five segments. And man, oh Man, what's this week's top five, Dustin? Uh, this one is films that redefined blockbusters, meaning, mm. it, it, you know, and that this is a really good list, y'all, because every time you feel like you got the blockbuster nailed, something changes. And no, oh, now it's a new definition of what a blockbuster is. So we're going to go over that. Now, I think you're going to enjoy this list of 10 films. They're uh, all good ones. Completely agree, completely agree. And I mean, speaking of blockbusters, this week we're going to be talking all about CinemaCon. That's yes. right. They had a lot of news coming out this past week, so we've dedicated the entire industry news segment to that specifically. And man, oh man, each studio really brought some heat to the news. And I mean, I'm super excited about a lot of it. And some stuff you might even be surprised that we're excited about because we've been kind of not trashing, but saying that we dislike some things. But then, you know, trailers come out and we're like, ooh, that kind of looks interesting. Yeah, so it's yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun to deep dive into that aspect of everything. But of course, before we get it all said and done and started, Go over to our merchandise website, www.crazyantmedia.com, where you can start rocking the latest and greatest Crazy Ant Media gear. We have shirts. We have hats. We have all of these different designs available to you right now on our website. Like I said, www.crazyantmedia.com, and be sure to follow the accounts, the ItCaf Podcast account and the Crazy Ant Media account, so that you know 
when these merchandise sales are happening so that you can get them for a cheaper price because with inflation and with how expensive everything is we know how it is so we want to help you get it for a cheaper price and how many people say that how many business owners say we want you to have it at a cheaper price that's, so that's right why you gotta follow us at crazy ant media and at it Cap podcast for the latest and greatest merchandise sales but like I teased a little bit ago, like two seconds, <laughs> CinemaCon 2024, this week's entire industry news segment is all about the movies. And because CinemaCon 2024 was held this past week, Warner Brothers, Lionsgate, Universal, Paramount, Disney, all of the biggies used the four days at CinemaCon to wow the theater owners and, of course, the press like ourselves – with their plans for the summer blockbuster reveals, um, and of course the season beyond the summer blockbusters. As you can imagine, a lot of huge reveals happened, um, from new trailers to exclusive footage to release dates, official casting announcements, and so much more. If you missed it, like we said, don't worry about it. We've got everything you need to know right here. So let's jump in by each studio, and you guys know, we love the one and only Disney, so that's the one we're going to be starting with. As always, the Mouse House, and by overwhelming consensus from everything I saw on every feed, every trade, everything, the Mouse House definitely had the best showing of the year. They brought some stuff, y'all, and it was huge. Okay, get ready. Buckle up, because here we go. It's a lot. Here's what the studio revealed from Disney and 20th Century Fox. 13 minutes of Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, and they revealed that it will be released, of course, May 10th. Daisy... Nope, that's you! <laughs> <laughs> we had a whole plan. We had a whole plan. a plan! I was so overwhelmed was by fine. Kingdom it's of the fine. Planet of the Apes! <laughs> <laughs> that's what it was. That's what it was. Yes, that's right. Daisy Ridley stars in Young Women and the Sea, a true story that's going to be releasing May 31st. Yes, and then Amy Poehler introduced the first 35 minutes of Inside Out 2. I'm super excited about that one. That one's releasing June 14th. Oh, super exciting, man. Super exciting. And one of the biggest things that we're most excited about, everybody knows we're huge comic book geeks. And man, oh man, everybody's wondering, the state of Marvel, what's going to happen? Well, Kevin Feige announced Fantastic Four is officially releasing July 25th of 2025. So that's huge, man. That's huge. Boom. And then Thunderbolts Asterisk releasing May 5th. Yes, Asterisk. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. <laughs> Right, exactly. What's the asterisk mean? What's in the box? <laughs> um, well, what is in the box is an exclusive clip for Captain America, A Brave New World, that is releasing on February 14th of 2025 on Valentine's Day. That's an interesting date. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then the stealer of the show, Sean Levy, came out and gave a nine-minute clip for Deadpool and Wolverine. Now, as you guys know, that one's releasing July 26th. It was, well, we're uh, going to talk about it. <laughs> we're going to talk <laughs> about it. But let's just say a lot of F-bombs were dropped. Oh, I mean, it wouldn't be them if not. It wouldn't be Ryan Reynolds if not. That's for sure. And then, of course, an exclusive clip for Alien Romulus releasing August 16th. That's exciting. Oh, yeah. Now, this one, hmm. A film called Night Bitch, <laughs> apparently with an unknown release date, but there you go. It's on the schedule. Disney will be releasing a film called Night Bitch. <laughs> that's right. We talked about it a few times on the show. We so did. If you want to know what that's about, go back to our previous episodes and be sure to catch yourself up to date with everything that is Night Bitch. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, James L. Brooks ella mckay to release in 2025 by 20th century studios because 20th century is still trying to put out some biggies especially those for you know the oscar award season so we'll see how that one does oh yeah yeah and the first trailer for the amateur starring rami malik and that one is set to release in 2025 that went over really well also i hear so love it i love it well, Mufasa, The Lion King, is releasing on December 20th and will feature all new songs, which is amazing. And remember, guys, I put this one on my most anticipated list 
for 2024. So I'm really pumped for this one. I think it's going to do big things, man. It's going to do big things. Oh, without doubt. And then the man, the myth, the legend who had everybody smelling what was cooking. Dwayne Johnson introduced the first trailer for Moana 2. And as we've told you on previous shows, that one is releasing on November 27th. That's right, baby. That's right. And then, of course, I mean, there's Disney. And then there's the biggest competitor. That is Warner Brothers Discovery. Okay, so we're going to jump over to the bunny, Warner Brothers, who also had a pretty solid showing. They did. And some major announcements. I mean, Warner Brothers has honestly been the studio for blockbusters recently. So they gave a new extended look at Fruosha. Mm. And a new look at the psychological thriller The Watchers. Man, that's what I'm saying. They got that dark undertone. And I mean, speaking of dark undertone, James Gunn jumps right in, joined via video to introduce a new documentary called Super Man, a Christopher Reeve story. Now, we've talked about that one on previous shows as well. So be sure to go back and deep dive about what that one's going to be about and what's their plan of release plan of distribution. We're super excited about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. And. He couldn't get out there and talk about the Godfather, the Mac Daddy, the OG Superman without talking about his Superman, of course. He didn't give too much, but he did reveal the official full Superman logo, the S. We saw part of it when he released that little image, but now we know the full logo. It is very representative of the Kingdom Come logo, so that was pretty badass. Completely agree. Completely agree. And the thing that is really going to make or break kevin costner's career Mm. let's be honest about it they gave a new extended look at horizon an american saga part one and part two now of course we told you on previous shows they will be released separately just a few months apart part one will be releasing june 28th and then part two will be releasing on august 16th oh yep 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 and he We'll talk about it. I have theory there. They also showed the first trailer for Mickey 17 starring Robert Pattinson. No, not Mickey. Not We're at the bunny now. It's a different Mickey. Robert Pattinson. That one was interesting. So yeah, check that trailer out if you see it. For sure. For sure. And then the first trailer for Trap, a story told from the perspective of a serial killer, mm. also came out. So that's interesting as well. Yes, and then we got a super awesome behind-the-scenes look at Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, not going to say it again. Yeah, yeah. oh my gosh, it was so good, y'all. If you can find the description of what it was, and we'll talk about it a little bit, but yeah, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, exclusive look. Ah, so good, so good. And then, of course, the biggie, the one everybody's talking about that's breaking records, the first trailer for Joker 2. We're going to deep dive into that a little bit later on the industry news, but man, oh man, what a thing. Oh yeah. (laughs) What a thing. Oh yeah. Now, jumping over to Paramount, where Transformers, Turtles, and Smurfs dominated most of their announcements. That's where all the buzz was coming from, but they did have some other stuff. They did reveal a new trailer for If, which is coming out, of course, May 17th. Very exciting. I'm excited for that one. I feel like, you know, family family comedy with John Krasinski there. Oh, yeah. Uh, Damien Chazelle's next film will be releasing in 2025, so just around the corner. Oh, yeah. And then what everybody has been waiting for, everybody's been wanting to hear, when is the next Star Trek movie coming out? Well, apparently it is coming out in 2025, and it's an origin movie that takes place well before not only the new timeline with Chris Pine and all them, but it takes place before the original series. So going way back. So that was some interesting news. I know that made a lot of Trekkies happy because we've been waiting and waiting. So, Oh, that's for sure, man. That's for sure. And then, of course, something people have been waiting for for, honestly, 10 plus years, I feel like. Now it's going to be Transformers and G.I. Joe, they're going to be doing a big, massive crossover film. That's going to be very interesting. New cast? Who knows? We'll uh, see. Yep, yep, yep. That, I mean, of course, that was hinted at. I, I think this is just official confirm Because at the end of Transformers, the Beast, Beast Wars, that, duh, right? If you saw that movie, you knew this was coming. So, uh, Edgar Wright's The Running Man 
Yes, Running Man. Remember that one with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Well, it's getting a remake, and it's starring the it man of the moment right now for sure, Glenn Powell. So that's exciting. That, uh, that's going to be pretty good. For sure, man. For sure. And then, of course, the Bee Gees. They're finally going to have their run in the biopic game, and they definitely have a massive leader at the helm. That's right. The one and only Ridley Scott will be directing this thing. So oh, that's very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And then, guys, guys, this one was exciting. We're going to deep dive into this one a little bit, too. The Last Ronin, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie. And it's going to be rated R. What? What? If you guys are familiar with the graphic novels that this spawned all of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies and cartoons and all that, it was dark and grimy and dirty. So rated R makes sense. So we'll see. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. For sure. For sure. Well, this couldn't be Hollywood in 2024 without a reboot, mm. right? I mean, there now the newest reboot that's going to be hitting next year is The Naked Gun. A comedy reboot. Man, I just, I don't know about it. I don't know about it. We'll deep dive into it, but eh, eh. I mean, that's going to be tough to remake and, and make it good. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, a new scary movie is apparently also coming in 2025. So um, if you weren't done with that franchise, good, because you're getting more. So there you go. There it is. Uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker are making a new movie that's coming out July 4th of 2025. Not Independence Day. but nope. And July they're collaborating <laughs> with some uh, musicians, right? So, I mean, yeah, that's going to be pretty good. Uh, a five-minute clip. This one is exciting, y'all, from Transformers 1, starring Chris Hemsworth as a young Optimus Prime. What? And Brian Tyree Henry as a young um, uh, Megatron. I, it's going to be amazing. It's also got Keegan-Michael Key and Scarlett Johansson. So... I mean, come on, y'all. Chris Hemsworth as a young Optimus Prime. I wonder if he's going to try to do the voice or like, I don't know, man. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Right? That voice is so iconic. Man. Oh, yeah. It's so iconic. Um, there's also a new Interstellar movie coming out. So that's going to be interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Revisiting that one. Okay. And, of course, Sonic 3 with the reveal of Shadow. Yep, they finally revealed Shadow. And that one's coming this Christmas, so right at the end of the year. Completely awesome, man. Completely awesome. And the trailer for Smile 2, one of Paramount's big horror movies a couple years ago, will be coming this October, so stay tuned for that. Ooh, yeah, yeah. I watched that one. Creepy as fuck, the, the original. Mm. It was. Uh, yep, they also showed, and this one got the crowd going, a five-minute extended look at Gladiator 2 coming this November. Everybody's pumped for that one. For sure, man, for sure. And another one everybody's pumped for is A Quiet Place, Day 1. Now, a new trailer for that is coming June 28th, so be sure to mark your calendars for that bad boy. Oh, yeah. And then there's a new animated Last Airbender movie, A-A-N-G, The Last Airbender. And they revealed who the villain is going to be in it, none other than Dave Bautista. He's going to voice the villain in it, so mm. that's pretty badass. For sure, for sure. Aang. Aang is his, it's the title of the last Aang, there, there you go. There you go. We're here to educate each other. Aang. That's for sure. That's for sure. Uh, a huge official cast announcement was announced for the new animated Smurfs movie, and that one will be coming out on Valentine's Day of 2025. Yes. And, okay, now, check this out, guys. We couldn't go find the list. We would run out of time to do our show if we listed. It's damn near every A-lister in Hollywood is voicing a Smurf. <laughs> like, I don't know how they pulled yeah. it off, but the cast is insane. That's going to be pretty awesome. Now, like I said, Trey Parker and Matt Stone coming out with a new movie, but they're also coming out with an original music, uh, musical, and with Kendrick Lamar. What? With Ken Okay, so they're doing a new, I'm guessing, South Park movie, but also revealed that they're doing a musical with Kendrick Lamar. Uh, okay. Very and July 4th, <laughs> right? which makes sense about what we talked about with Disney with the release date for Fantastic Four. We'll talk about that a little bit. So I, I see why maybe that was different. So we'll see. We'll talk about it. For sure. For sure. 
Well, NBC Universal didn't have much uh, as large of a slate, I guess you could say. Uh, but they did have some exciting stuff to announce. Yeah. And I mean, a five minute clip from Despicable Me 4 that's releasing July 3rd. I mean, that's a huge franchise. I mean, they've done three of them so far and about to do a fourth one. So, of course, it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And finally confirmed. We all knew it was coming, but now it's official. A new Super Mario Brothers movie is in the works for 2026. Nice, nice, love it, love it. Well, a new look at Twisters, with an S, uh, coming July 19th. That's got your boy Jen, Glenn Powell in it as well. So like you said, he's the it factor right now. Oh yeah, he's killing it right now. And then we got confirmation again for another one I think everybody knew was coming. Five Nights at Freddy's 2 was announced for fall of 2025. It came right out of the gate, made a shit ton of money. That's, that's a no-brainer that number two was coming. Yeah, completely agree. Completely agree. And then a teaser for Blumhouse's Wolfman. Mm. This one's been kind of loosely talked about for the past couple of years. So I'm finally glad to see it come to fruition. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then they also had another teaser for Speak No Evil coming September 13th. So there you go. There it is, man. There it is. Uh, trailers for Back to Black, The Bike Riders, Conclave, and Nostrofo um also are going to be coming out so that's exciting oh yeah and then lupita nyong'o came on stage surprised everybody and introduced a trailer for dreamworks's the wild robot what okay mm. interesting interesting now ariana grande and Cynthia ivro have been working on this little thing called wicked for the past couple years i feel like and they introduced the first extended look for part one and part two i know hollywood is really excited about this thing oh yeah they are and i hear they even did a little bit of singing yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. All right, now let's jump over to Lionsgate, the smallest of the studios, but had a big presentation because, you know, they have a lot of interesting stuff coming out of the studio. First and foremost, there can be only one. Highlander starring our boy Henry Cavill. I'm super excited about this. Logan knows. Anybody who knows me knows I got both the Highlander. I've got Connor McLeod's and Dunker McLeod's uh, swords. So I'm a, I'm a Highlander fan. <laughs> I'm excited for this one, man. I think it's going to be pretty damn good. For sure, for sure. Well, Naruto, directed by Destin Daniel Creighton, mm. is also going to be coming out. They finally announced that one. It's unclear if it's a live action or animated, um, but I'm sure we can go into deeper detail with that a little bit later on. But, I mean, it's nice to see. It's a cult classic anime, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, no doubt about it. And Now You See Me 3, starring John Cena. Kidding. I'm kidding. It's right. not. But it is coming. Now You See Me 3 with all of the original cast returning. So that's going going to be pretty epic for sure for sure something that i i'm not sure how to feel about yet because it was such a cult classic there's going to be another blair witch project and from my understanding it's going to be a reboot um so that's going to be interesting we'll see how that goes yeah we'll talk about that a little bit i'm, I'm kind of right there with you we're kind of, and now this one only makes sense because when you have a huge film the biggest movie of last year billion gazillion dollars based on a mattel property or a game or a doll or whatever you want to go back to the person who made that happen for your next game movie. So they did finally reveal that a Monopoly movie is coming. Live action Monopoly movie based on the game. And Margot Robbie is behind it. She, Lucky Chap, is going to make it. That only makes sense. Go to the person who knows how to do them. That's all I'm saying. Exactly, exactly. Next year we're going to be announcing that she's doing Candyland and Clue and then <laughs> yeah, all of these just other like, ones. You know. So stay tuned for that. Um, well, Guy Ritchie in The Gray, starring Jake Gyllenhaal, Henry Cavill, Isa Gonzalez, Rosemond Pike. That one's going to be releasing in 2025. What mm. a phenomenal cast. I'm super excited about it. Guy Ritchie's kind of on a little roll right now. He is, right? And Jake Gyllenhaal and Henry Cavill are like, wait a minute, Glenn Powell. We're still rocking, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we, we got a couple things, too. You're not taking all of our shit. Come on. Uh, Ariana Greenblatt showed off a new trailer for Borderlands, so that's pretty exciting. I hear that one was really good. For sure. Well, horror film Never Let Go, starring Haley, or, yeah, Haley Berry. 
is going to be coming out as well. Horror is supposed to be that sure thing right now. So we'll see how that goes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, everybody's getting on board with these. The best Christmas pageant ever, question mark. <laughs> that one's coming to the screens November 8th. So no word on who's starring in that one or what it's all about. But a Christmas movie coming in November. It's going to be good, I'm sure. For sure, for sure. And everybody's wondering, what's Mark Wahlberg doing next? Well, he's doing Flight Risk next. Yeah. And that's all we got for that one. <laughs> there you go. And then, of course, another one that says, wait a minute, guys. I'm still here, too. Dave Batista. He's got another one coming. The Killers Game, starring Dave, along with Sophia Botella, Palm Klemptiff. Oh, they're doing a little reunion of the Guardians. That's nice. Terry Crews and Ben Kingsley. Wow, that's a cast right there, man. It really is, man. It really is. Uh, well, Good Fortune is going to be starring Keanu Reeves and Aziz uh, Aziz Asnari. So that's very exciting. I mean, I like that Keanu Reeves may or may not be stepping out of that John Wick role, even though there is going to be another one coming. But still, you don't want to get typecast. No, you don't want to. But it's okay because they did reveal a new John Wick movie, but it's not the one you think. It's the first look at Ballerina starring Ana de Armas, so that's going to be badass, and that footage was incredible, y'all. I'm excited for that one. I think this is a good transition into different areas of that world, so I'm pretty pumped for that, man. Completely agree. Completely agree. And then finally, they got a first look at Michael Jackson's biopic, and that one's going to feature about 30-plus songs. Man, oh, man. I bet that thing's going to be, like, almost three hours long oh i mean there's no doubt. way it couldn't be that i mean it goes through he went through so much in his life so how do you not like take time and shine light on different aspects of it right so, oh I yeah mean, yeah it's it's gonna be crazy but okay. yeah man i mean CinemaCon. that that's I, a lot of stuff look, i mean let's be honest about it I think Paramount won. I think Paramount had the most. Do you? To okay, talk okay. About I, and the most exciting thing. For me, I'm just going to give it to Disney strictly for Deadpool 3 or Deadpool and Wolverine. Okay, listen, guys. This, uh, this, is how, this is how great it was. First of all, before anything even started, they had a little thing pop up on the screen telling people to turn off their cell phones. And it was fucking Deadpool and Wolverine basically cursing the shit out of people for phones going off kind of a thing. Fucking hilarious. But then when they did the actual nine-minute presentation, if you haven't read it or, or the description or anything, y'all... Before it was even introduced, the, the, everybody, the audience, the crowds, everything's asking Kevin Feige, wh how, what do you think? You've seen it. What do you think? And he's like, well, it's R-rated, so I can say this. It's fucking awesome. Straight up, Kevin Feige said it's <laughs> fucking awesome. And then it comes on, y'all, and it is nine minutes of pure F-bombs and raunchy shit. He's basically saying that he finally said, it's time, I told 20th Century Fox to fuck off, I'm going to Disneyland. And he said, the only condition that Kevin Feige had for me was no cocaine. And as he's saying that, he's covered in powder with bags of cocaine. And then he's like, talking about hosting a birthday party for his blind friend, you know, the from the movies and stuff. But he mistaken the girls, and they're actually sex workers and strippers, and they're all scantily clad, and like all this kind of, it's basically basically nine minutes of him fucking doing everything Feige said would never show up in a Marvel or Disney movie, basically giving him all the big F you, breaking the fourth wall the whole time, and then they are holding very close to the vest Wolverine. They, it was like, from what I understand, a boom, and you missed him kind of a scene, but he is in full costume, and of course... <laughs> Deadpool wouldn't be Deadpool if it wasn't if he wasn't him. So he looks at him, and from what I understand from the description, he kind of looks at him real quick and says, "Man, what the fuck? Friends don't let friends dress as L.A. Rams fans because he's in the blue and fucking uh -huh. yellow. So he's just like like fucking with his costume and shit. So for me, I mean, come on, man. That, like I am so fucking ready for this film. I I mean, I've been waiting forever to see him in the full costume with the mask and everything, but. The idea that they're just going to let it go and he's going to – I mean they've been saying forever, don't worry. We're not going to make it not Deadpool. It's going to be everything you want it to be and clearly this nine minutes secured that. I think fans are fucking pumped, bro. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean 
I definitely think that was the most talked about thing from CinemaCon. It definitely seems like it, even more than, you know, the Joker trailer that did get record amount of views on YouTube, yep. uh, bigger than Barbie. So, I mean, that was announced. But I, the reason I say Paramount is because there, I feel like a lot of the announcements that were at CinemaCon are about a lot of going back to property that they have already touched on they're going back to reliable franchises um so i feel like you know paramount is doing yes they also have reliable franchises that they're going back to as well they're going with the mold but they're stepping outside of it too with i feel like if that's yeah. a big risk because, oh because yeah. i mean the family films are definitely you know they're supposed to be reliable but i feel like this imagination that john krasinski came up with it's definitely different it's something completely different when it comes to the family genre oh yeah so that's very exciting and then i also feel like you know the <laughs> i don't know if paramount is trying to also go with the marvel mode the mold that deadpool 3 is with the teenage New mutant ninja turtles rated r film i mean that kind of you know is walking in the same vein but, I mean, the Bee Gees biopic with Ridley Scott, that's huge. And Who I feel they like... cast in that is going to be massive. Because, yeah, I mean, casting agree. the Bee Gees, it's going to make or break that film. I don't care how great Ridley Scott is, right? It, you ha It's like the Beatles one coming up. If you fucking cast yeah. the Beatles incorrectly or cast the Bee Gees incorrectly, your movie's fucking over. It's done, right? So, like... Yeah. Woo! And to your point, though, like I like I kind of hinted, because I'm a huge fan. I've been a fan of the graphic novels before anybody even knew who these people were. But the the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were dark. It was black and white, hardcore adult graphic novel. So I feel like they're just going back to the original source material and saying, "Okay, let's do it. Fuck it, seems to be working. Let's do it." So, um, and you brought it yeah, up. I completely agree. Oh no, sorry, you brought yeah. it up. Uh, Joker too. Yeah. Uh, I, we were talking about it. We were like, eh, no part of it. I don't want to see it. I fucking, I, I, no, no. And then that trailer, but for me, I thought the trailer, bro, kind of, and maybe I'm just interpreting it, it's because it's what I desperately want it to be so that I will go see it. But we've talked about it. I said, I'd be okay if it wasn't like a legit musical, but that if every so often we get a little song and dance number because he's thinking in, in his head. He's like, because he's a fucking psychopath. And so if he's envisioning these little dance and song numbers like to try to justify these things with, with Harley Quinn or something, and it's only every so often, I would be fine with that. I'd go see that. Um, and that's what the trailer made it look like anyway right it didn't seem like it was a full out every other scene's gonna be a, a musical number kind of a thing it just made it look like maybe he was playing some shit in his head and i'd be okay with that if that's it because all right i'll admit it i've been dogging the shit out of it forever but i, I kind of fucking like the trailer <laughs> I, I liked I know, the like trailer this, like i said on social media too yeah it, it's a really good looking trailer like in i mean it's very beautiful too. Oh. Like when it comes to storytelling and cinematography and like classic film, it is very much that. And I'm wondering if they're doing the same thing that Kevin Feige did with Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, classifying that as a horror film, mm. but it wasn't really a horror film. It was more a thriller and you had like one or two jump scares. Right. Right. Um and with this one, yeah, maybe you're right, where there is one or two or a few uh, song and dance numbers to where like yeah it is going through his head but yeah I mean and especially for me as someone I've been very vocal about this too I didn't really like the first one I thought it was hard to watch and I mean yeah that's what the story is um, but like a big thing for me and I've talked about this a million times is rewatch value and feeling you have when walking out of it that's such a dark film. I didn't have a good feeling walking out of it. And then I did not want to rewatch it at all. So, I mean, those are the two biggest things for me that the reason why I didn't like it, but I, I don't know, man, something about this trailer is 
brilliant but i still can't buy her as harley Quinn. yeah yeah Margo i'm not is so good as harley quinn i still can't buy her as harley quinn. no because this is a very different version of harley quinn and i'm just not sold yeah. on it I, I harley quinn was very specific in what she was supposed to be and who she's supposed to be and this is a just a very different take on it i'm not sure i'm okay with it um and i'm like you though i loved the first movie but did not rewatch it i've only seen it once the time we saw it in the theater and yeah. that was it um i also did not want to watch it again even though i loved it um yeah a couple other just quick things i want to talk about um i'm thrilled that they are going to release superman theatrically you mm -hmm. guys now we talked about mm -hmm. it and the plan was originally to debut it on max but now it is going to get a theatrical release i think it's the perfect way to build up momentum for superman for gun Superman. I think it's like, here's the OG. Let's talk about all of the miraculous stuff that Superman was and what he stood for and how Christopher Reeve portrayed it. It's a great buildup. And to do it in a theater is going to be just fantastic. And then, of course, the logo. I fucking love the logo. I like that they're not just going with the generic original S and trying to just change it a little bit. Like, the, you know, I like that it's different. So, man, I'm pumped about those. For sure, man. For sure. And I... Before we transition into our guest segment, I was honestly very disappointed with NBC Universal. As the studio who just won Best Picture, who just like had an amazing year at the Oscars for Oppenheimer, they didn't have a large slate. And then the stuff they did are either the sequels, the reboots, and nothing really that is like jumping out at me. I mean, I guess the most like it thing i'm excited for for nbc universal is either it's probably the twister sequel yeah um yeah with glenn powell or i mean blumhouse's wolfman but other than that like i was i'm really disappointed with nbc universal because they i mean like i said when we first came back after the oscars after you win best picture you have a new status quo you're you're basically like the biggest guy in town yeah right everybody yeah. wants to come shop their projects with you and to see this, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty upset and not upset, but disappointed about it. So yeah, I mean, hot take, I guess. So. Yeah. Yeah. And then just two quick things, because we mentioned it at the top, Thunderbolts, <laughs> Thunderbolts Whoa. asterisk. So Feige yes. would not go into detail. All he said is that that is the title. The asterisk was not a typo or a mistake. And that after the movie is released, they would explain the asterisk and what it means. Mm. That's all we got. That, that that was pretty cool, though. Thunderbolts did show Cap's new costume. It did show Harrison Ford as Thunderbolt Ross as the president. And he's basically the scene that they released is him asking Cap to reform the Avengers. So that's Ooh. pretty badass. And then the other one, quickly, that I said I was surprised by, I thought the, the go-to release date, for fucking Fantastic Four would be July 4th. It only made fucking right? perfect sense. But as we went through all of the other studios' announcements and release dates, it looks like the weekend of July 3rd, 4th, 5th is going to be packed with huge movies and huge franchises. And Fantastic Four has got a lot riding on it. Uh, I mean, it's a huge bet to finally get it right. And they're like, you know what? We're not going to open it against all these fucking other blockbusters. We're going to just, like, we're going to back off. We're going to wait a couple weeks and then debut it. So there you go. I think, I think you know, everybody was kind of hoping for a fourth release uh, for the four Fantastic. But, uh, you know, it makes sense to me. I think it's a wise move by Disney and Marvel. And uh, I think it's going to work out. Yeah, man, completely agree. I'm super excited about a lot of this stuff, though. I mean, like we said, they released a lot of stuff at this convention. And, I mean, honestly, another winner to take away from this is Dave Bautista. He's in a quite... And Henry Cavill. Yeah. They're both in quite a few different things for different studios. So they're they're like, hey, we can still do other things that are not superhero movies. Exactly. So really exciting to see. Um, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm excited about a lot of stuff, so we'll see how it goes and, um, all the good things, all the good oh, things. Oh, yeah. But something else that's really freaking good is this guest interview that we have for everybody. That's right. We have the one and only Fiona Renee from CBS's hit show Tracker 
on the podcast to talk all about the show and talk what it's like working with Justin Hartley and so much more. <laughs> she may or may not have mentioned how fun it was to jump the bones of, uh, you know, of, uh, of a few castmates. Um, well, well yeah. you know, we'll talk about that too, of course. Um, but what she starts off really deep though, talking about how she moved around a lot and how she used that as a positive to make her more adaptable to from set to set and new cast and new cat. And, and so it was a really interesting, interesting dynamic to take something that could have been traumatic and turn it into something positive moving forward in her career so um that kind of gives you guys an idea of what this interview is man we're all over the map with this one but it's got nice ambiance of a fireplace and it's a really comfortable fun conversation man for sure for sure well here she is fiona renee welcome inside the crazy ant form how are you I feel great. How are you guys? Oh, we are living the dream, as always. Living the dream. Same. Yes. Oh, my feeling gosh. Feeling good. Feeling yes. good. This yes. is actually my uh, first interview. Oh, well, it's both of our first interview back since I got married. So yes. I'm very excited to talk yes. to you. Congratulations. Gosh, let's not talk about marriage. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. No, 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 no. yeah. I, love, I would love to talk about marriage. No. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. yes. I appreciate it. To give you a little bit more insight on us and how we roll as a company and as a podcast, he is actually my father in law. Yes. I met him he married first, the daughter. <laughs> and then I met his daughter. Yes. Oh. My, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Can we all just wish we had that relationship with our in-laws? Hello? Right. That's the thing. That's yeah. The thing. Yeah. I, I just. <laughs> Everyone around the world is just gagging. We're like, we wish we had that. <laughs> uh, you know, no, it, trust it's. Me, we'll, we'll get to the part where uh, you had to call your ex-boyfriend. For yeah. A, like a little YouTube show. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get to that part. Oh, we'll my gosh. That, that was so funny. <laughs> and the, and the, and the really the only good thing he had to say was he remembers the horizontal stuff <laughs> yeah i was like come on my man you can do better than that come on and not that being all over the internet oh my yeah, right like uh, i mean <laughs> as i said as i said there's so much to dive into talking to you about all of the stuff you've done it's so funny but all kidding aside, your background was like really awesome when we were doing our research and kind of like you come from a very similar uh, upbringing that we both did about the bouncing around all over the place and having the oh, new town, new state, new school. How do we get friends? Like kind of a thing. We, we both kind of went through that as well. Um, all for very different reasons. <laughs> My dad yeah, passed yeah. and mom was kind of like the same with your dad. Like, OK, job here, job there, job. There. So um, but yeah, so I want to kind of dive in. Let's start like right there with that kind of going on and and the constant movement and the having to constantly reestablish yourself kind of a thing how did acting happen with it was that always on the radar was it something you always knew you wanted to do or do you how do you fall you know, into that yes it is and it's crazy because i've i've said this in interviews in the past where i did this play in the second grade called It's a Jungle Out There, and I played this rainbow-striped zebra, and I got <laughs> off stage, and I was like, Mom, Dad, this is what I want to do forever. And, and it really, it was kind of that cliche story where I knew very young that that's what I wanted to do, but I didn't really know what that meant, Right. obviously, until I got older and I actually started working. Um, and honestly, you know, Tra traumatic childhood is such a, it's a phrase that, you know, is a bit of a spectrum phrase. There's, there's trauma in many, many forms. Um, and I feel like acting is the one thing that was my, con my constant. Mm. It was like, I always knew that that's what I wanted to do. So no matter what kind of bad stuff happened or what kind of trouble I got into or what kind of change was happening, I always kind of had that to go back to and ground mm. myself with. So no matter what town we moved to, I was looking for where the drama club was and yeah. I wanted to be in the school play. So even if I didn't have many friends, I knew that that's where I wanted to go was the school play. So it, yeah, it was kind of the one thing that I've always known I wanted to do. Uh, and then that, because I was so damn headstrong and like, that's what I want to do. It was interesting. All the little avenues on like how you think it's going to look to get there and how you're like totally wrong. <laughs> that's so true. So true. It really yeah. is. Cause yeah, there's so many different aspects that you can take away from that because you know, that's your, that's kind of your sense of home, right? You know, you bouncing around a lot right. as a child, but you finding your sense of home 
in a reality that's not even necessarily real or not right. real unless it's on the page, uh, which is very interesting. I love that, too, because there's all of these different aspects of actors and as human beings, too, because as someone who moved around a lot, were you that quiet kid or did you try to make an no. impression and then it always <laughs> kind of just fell back and like, oh, shit, what the fuck did I just do? <laughs> it's interesting. I I was never the quiet kid. Um I was bullied heavily really? in many different schools, um, which in a way was like, is this going to suck the life out of me? Right. Um, and I think I went through phases as a child in social situations where, you know, I was loud and brash because I wanted to get attention and maybe mm. that didn't work. And then maybe I would... Um, kind of close off and act like I was too cool for everything mm. because that was my defense mechanism at the time. Like I think uh, every strategy in a way was somewhat a um, armor mm -hmm. to wear. Um, but as a child in, in safety around my family, around people that I felt like really comfortable with, I was the farthest from shy, the farthest from quiet if anything, it was the opposite. My parents told me this story recently. My dad was like, you know, we could never take you to a restaurant. <laughs> and I was like, why? He's like, because you would just scream, yell. Even as a toddler, you would just be climbing on things, screaming. Then when you got older and you learned how to talk, you just wouldn't stop going to other people's tables <laughs> and oh talking goodness. to these strangers. He's like, so we just like didn't want to take you out because you're such a handful. <laughs> so I, th I think in general, I was more of a shock factor child. Yeah, when I was a quiet child. You know, the, that's interesting too. I, I just love this whole dynamic because y you know you think about movies and TV and acting and all that, and it's an escape, right? It's how people escape from reality. And yet for you, it was your grounding of of I'm doing all this yeah. other stuff, and that's where I go to not escape, but to find some stability. Which th that in itself is is very interesting. And then. This is an industry that's built heavily on rejection. We like to call, you know, selection instead of rejection, but it is oh. what it is, and it's tough. <laughs> so for you to mention, you, you know, through the childhood, you're dealing with bullying and having to acclimate into different situations, and you're trying on different armors. You're kind of already mm. going through a mental battle before you even get to the whole, now I'm going to go into an industry where I'm going to hear no all the time, and I'm not going to be good yeah. enough, or I'm not going to be... Did, did, because I think I saw also that you said that it, you were kind of almost grateful for the bouncing around because it taught you how to be okay walking into a room of strangers or, or being able mm -hmm. to adapt to a new location quickly. So did the bullying yeah. and the different, and I'm also curious as to why you were bullied. You're so just amazing and, and sweet. You seem like I would, the last person I'd want to bully, but, um, but did oh, those, so type, yeah, right? Like, come on, you're very <laughs> sweet. Like what was wrong with these kids? Um. But did that kind of help you further on in the adulthood and in that career going, yes. hey, I've taken all the shit. I've had people call me yes. this or call me that. I'm good yes. with this, right? At that point, I feel like yeah. your skin was probably as tough as it needed to be to get rejected acting, right? Yeah, I would agree with you drastically, Dustin. I, I think that, um, well, one, uh, Robert Downey Jr. in his speech this year at the Oscars, he said, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, – my traumatic childhood. Yes. And I'd like to thank the Academy in that order. And I was like, I am stealing that <laughs> right. for every single award I ever received. Yes. That that's going to be it. Because I do, I do think that whether this is right or wrong, I don't necessarily think it's the right thing, but it did having bullying and trauma and um, moving around a lot and having these things that are very uh, not stable. Right. Um, and having a, a sense of confidence in an inst in in an unstable environment, unstable environment, um, I think definitely prepared me for Hollywood and an acting career because I, I honestly can't imagine coming from a space of stability and uh, and not having a lot of change and not having a lot of instability and then getting thrown into Hollywood and being like. <laughs> Enjoy. Yeah. Right. Uh, hope you have a good support network. Um, so yeah, it definitely prepared me because it, it can be, uh, it can be like dark and like yeah. hard, like really mentally hard. I mean, even working now, 
I y'all this morning I woke up at 5:55 a.m., which is not when I wake up. Uh, had a full blown anxiety panic attack. That's not my norm, by the way. <laughs> um, my partner, he's the one with anxiety, not me. Right. Um, and I, it was about work. It was me being. We had some executives come on set yesterday, mm. and a couple of a, a new guest star who's a pretty big name. And, you know, I was a little nervous. I wanted to make sure I did a good job. And I left work thinking, yeah, that was fine. I did great. It was fine. And I went home and I woke up at five in the morning, sweating, going, it wasn't fine. I, I didn't get my line right. And, and I should have done better. And, and, you know, and it's such a weird, even like once you, once you book the job, you still have yeah. this insatiable need to please and to make sure you do well and to have the audience like you and, you know, that's hard enough at a regular n- normie job in the office where you want to prove to your boss you did well or to your parents that you did well. But TV and film, or, you know, the audience it brings it to another level. So I feel like, yes, my child had prepared me so much for that, but it honestly just never goes away. Mm. Um, I think it's something that every actor and every performer and in a, in a sense, every human has to come to terms sure. with. And kind of figure out how they navigate th- their own process of pleasing others and having the anxiety of of doing a good job or not being good enough, et cetera. And mm. yeah, your skin. I've I heard two things recently. One, I think developing a tough skin is so important and so helpful for those kinds of things. But then you don't want a skin that's so tough that nothing can get in. Right. Mm. And nothing can come out. Yep. You know, it's like the skin and the armor is, is great to, to, I don't know, protect you. But then also, like, love then doesn't get in. And then, like, that's what's right. the whole point? Yep. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. I love that, though, because, I mean, there's so many different aspects to take away from that. Um, if you don't know, we also have a mental health podcast. So talking about mental health is something that we are very familiar with and it's uh it's very opening and it's very honest because you know once we always call it our bi-weekly therapy session because we are <laughs> able to just talk about it on a, like a public forum just to like get it out there um so it's yeah. always very um it's very freeing to be able to do that and i do also want to say thank you for sharing your past traumas with the bullying aspect because that is very oh, difficult yeah. to be able to relive and to have someone like yourself share that it helps the next person who listens to this or listens to your story so that's always very important um but while you were talking and speaking about anxieties about time and how because we always know we know we're filmmakers ourselves um so we know time is money when you're on set um he he likes to refer to it more than i do because he's an old person Um, when when it was actual film and you were burning it you couldn't just hit erase and start over (laughs) but i'm curious though do you have more anxiety on a television set that is a well-oiled machine that needs to produce um episodes every single week rather than a film set that can take a little bit more time but not much because like we just said time is money so i'm just curious about the anxiety between the two creative processes tv's fast yeah it is so fast i mean i did an indie film with my partner uh in 2022 and you know the film was 98 pages long Mm -hmm. uh and we shot it uh over like three months Mm. wow um you know but a a total of maybe 70 days or something like over the the course of three months um uh, ish don't quote me on numbers but (laughs) that being said i'm like we're shooting 60 pages, 57 pages in eight days. Mm, yeah. yeah. And not only are we shooting that, we are shooting usually lots of action scenes, Yeah, big, you know, lots of background, lots of, you know, it's busy. You've got 200 people on set all trying to communicate. I mean, anyone knows that like, yes, you it's easier to do a large job with more people, but also it's harder because everyone has to communicate and getting 200 people to communicate is like the (laughs) hardest thing to do. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, 
I think you get the anxiety of like making sure you hit your line, you hit your mark, say it right da, 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 on any set. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like every actor feels that way, but for TV, for sure. I mean, let's get two takes. Let's turn around. Let's move on right, because right. we've got a 12 hour day. And if we go overtime, CBS has to pay overtime and then they're going to be mm. pissed at me. And then I'm yeah. nervous that I'm going to get to be cast <laughs> in season two. We don't okay, need you know? that. No, <laughs> like, we don't well, need that. And yeah, much more corporate, a lot more politics, it feels yeah. like. And you talked imagine. about, too, the pressure that, that you feel, you know, like you, when, you, when you, you you booked it and now there's even more pressure. And I would think that elevates even more yeah. when it comes out of the gate as a huge hit show. Because now the executives are showing up. Now it's a moneymaker. Now it's got to be, you've got to hit it. Boom, 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 boom. Because it's not just one of those, is it going to find an audience? Maybe we'll move it to a different night it seems to be okay it's gotta no this is like boom hit and now it's running and you're gonna oh yeah i can't miss a line i can't fuck up a day i've right. got to like you know right. so uh, the pressure's got to be insane on that and you know we, we had the executives and the showrunner there yesterday yeah and i just could not get this one damn line <laughs> and I, you know like in the long run in the big picture of life who fucking cares exactly exactly, exactly. but also, billions of dollars and audience in, in my job, you know, like it's it is this weird dichotomy of both of like, this is the end of the world. And also who fucking cares? Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of the day. Right. It was a line. Yeah. It, it was kind of yeah. a thing. Yeah. Uh, just, and if it's shit, they'll cut it and they'll move on. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Well, we've been kind of tiptoeing around it, um, but we're talking about Tracker, everybody. And yes. We're super excited to uh, deep dive into everything with your involvement with the series. Um, while watching the series, I have realized I... Patrick Dempsey from Grey's Anatomy, that's when he started to be my man crush. Um, but now, Justin Hartley has now become my man crush because of Tracker. Um so and I have to give kudos to you because of that, because the dynamic that you two have on screen every time you guys are scene partners is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so bravo to that. You make Thank me want you. to um, potentially question my sexuality. And my wife's over here looking at me. Like Dude, you just married uh, my daughter, bro. What are we doing uh, right now? Uh, <laughs> We're less than I'm a week into this whole thing. I'm what are we confessing. doing? Like <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I mean, it's such a brilliant show. And I mean, it kicked off right after the Super Bowl, if no one knew, and it mm. drew in an amazing audience. And to be able to find its footing at CBS, where I feel like it's so good at these type of procedural shows, this kind of like crime drama type of thing. Oh. Um Let's start at the very beginning. Was it a very standard process of, you know, no. your agent was like, hey, no. I might have a role for you. No, it no, was no. so weird. It was, <laughs> it was so weird. And in general, ever since one COVID and two actor strike, Ugh. writer strike, yeah, the industry in Hollywood has changed a lot. We're doing so mm -hmm. many self tapes. We're not doing as many screen tests. Um, it's just, I mean, when you go into it as an actor, going into you know moving from Shawnee, Oklahoma to Hollywood, you're like already. I don't know. I have no fucking idea how this works. Yeah. Who knows? No one teaches you. You get a degree in acting at school and no one, you never learn that shit. No. You yeah. just learn, you know, how to memorize lines and how to stretch and ha, ha, ha. like that's so one, it's already complicated and confusing, but two, then all of a sudden with COVID and strikes, like they made it even more confusing because it's changing right. again. So in my particular scenario, um, I self-taped for the role. At the time, the role was a possible recurring guest star. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just had one scene in the pilot, or two scenes in the pilot. Um, they were thinking that maybe my character would return um, a, a, maybe a couple more times throughout the season. But she wasn't written in the books nor in the original um, idea of the show as someone mm -hmm. who's there all the time. Mm -hmm. And... Ken Olin and Justin, you know, they worked on This Is Us for years. They've got great rapport. I met them on the pilot, and they were just so awesome. Um, yeah. Just, I don't know, I kind of felt like an uncle and a brother. Yeah, you know, yeah. you just, like, shoot the shit. And I'm like, shut up, you guys. And they're like, shut up, Fiona. <laughs> and it didn't, fe it didn't feel like um, high stakes. 
it mm-hmm. felt very comfortable and that's the that's the weird thing about doing guest stars you know on television is that you're getting thrown into a group of people that already know each other right you know you have to bring this confidence as if you are meant to be there but you're always thinking am i supposed to be here um so it's a it's an interesting kind of dynamic energetically when you go on set as a guest star and they really made it to where it felt comfy so after the pilot we shot the pilot before we even knew about whether or not we were going to get a full season um ken reached out to me and he was like hey we we really like your character and your chemistry with justin we're trying to move some stuff around and then she turned into a series regular Mm -hmm. um so it was like you know an actor's dream to like get get uh, get a line yeah let the line stretch you you know they bring me back so that's kind of like a You know, it was like a weird, it was hard enough to get the guest star role, but then to like get that stretched into um, an actual regular role was like, wow, this this is not normal. This is different. Okay, Um, well, I want to say that one, I think it's a huge testament to your acting ability and the the skill and, and, and that you bring to it. Because honestly, anybody who watched This Is Us, let's be honest, Justin had some stuff that was just like level like so for them to for ken to come to you and say hey your chemistry is right there and you're pulling these things off with justin that is a huge credit to go you're right there with justin and and we need to have you more there right so that that's huge and i just real quick i want to show my age i remember justin all the way back from like smallville and he and he did a little (laughs) he did a little they were gonna spin aquaman off into its own series and he did that pilot so you know i don't logan if he's your man crush you should watch the aquaman pilot he's like basically naked the whole time and it's like you know just <laughs> go have some fun my friend no <laughs> but anyway and i even remember ken olin from 30 something way back yeah. in the day so yeah. i know these guys and i know what they're bringing to it right so i think cbs though for you and let's bring up your other one because we're both huge fans of the other one too we were devastated when rebecca was no longer on fire country we're like what the fuck where is rebecca and by the way Me too. Where, you know, where'd freddie go because we love w trey too we interviewed him and he he's great and we're like what I do you mean rebecca and freddie morning. are gone like That's what funny. is going on but i literally i love trey I just texted him this morning um i know yeah, they just, be, they just be getting rid of people. I, I like really I didn't. Un, we didn't understand it because the whole point he went to take the fall and go back to prison is to save Freddie, and now Freddie's gone. Like, what the fuck is going on? But anyway, back to your character. There, it's funny how you said that you come on with this confidence level and the and these type things because that character Rebecca was very just like. Bam, confident. You're going to do what I want yeah. you to do, and I'm going to jump your bones right now, or I'm going to get you out of prison right now kind of a thing. She wasn't. And uh, let's be honest about it. Brody ain't no small man. So when Rebecca's like, say, I'm just going to jump you right now, you're going to do it. All right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but the level that you brought to that role, the, the one that you could be somebody that could have that back and forth with Brody, but then also the the genuine sentimentality of the, the dynamic with Freddie going, I'm going to get you out. You're an innocent man. I don't know what I can do i'm going through my own shit but i'm gonna get you i got your back kind of a thing that dynamic i think this the executives at cbs and ken and all them i think it was a no-brainer they're probably like yeah hire her for tracker it's like she's already great there i wish i would i would i wish i could be a fly on the wall I, and know what internal conversations were happening inside the cbs offices um but CBS really, I've, I've got to give a shout out to Claudia Lyons. She um, she was at ABC mm-hmm. as the VP of talent and casting over there when I did the ABC showcase in 2018. Okay. And so she got to know me pretty well um, in almost like a student-like mm-hmm. setting mm-hmm. where, um, you know, she was watching me work, how, how, I, how I work with the script. Um, and then when she moved over... To talent and casting at CBS, I think she kind of kept me in mind, and nice. so I, I think you know, as they were auditioning and as I was getting little roles here and there for different CBS shows, um, you know, she knew not only what I would bring on to a set regarding a self tape, but kind of like my energy or maybe my work ethic or something like that, which. 
I, I'm assuming, I mean, if I was an executive, it's a, it's a huge deal because it yeah. doesn't matter necessarily how great of an actor someone is uh, if they are bad energy on set, if they're going to bring the vibes down on set because everyone is working 16-hour days, no one's seeing their damn families. Everyone has to be so dedicated to this and so willing to make sacrifices to make this thing happen that if there's someone there who's ungrateful, if there's someone there who's causing you know problems when – it's not for the, the the greater good. Right. You know, it doesn't matter how great you can act. Like, no, we can't afford that. Um, there's too many people involved. So I think executives do take that into consideration. And I would hope to think I, that, you know, that has something to do with casting as well on a bigger sp- space. Um, but Fire Country, you know, I didn't know that I was going to die. <laughs> um, <laughs> We were shooting episode. I love that this is over now, so I can talk about it. We were shooting episode fourteen. I think I died in episode fifteen. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we were shooting episode fourteen, and one of the guys on set, he was like a tech guy. Um, I won't say his name. He came up to me and he was like, "Man, you know those writers really? I'm so pissed. Like, I'm gonna really miss you." And I was like, "What? What?" <laughs> and he was like, "Because on." next episode you're uh uh and he mm. realized kind of in the moment what was happening yeah. and i was like Shit. next episode what <laughs> yeah, like... and you know it, that's just not how you want to find out no right? definitely not and i called the showrunner and i was like what's going on <laughs> and she was like oh, i'm sorry i didn't want you to find out this way and you know it, it but that is very sadly that is very common mm. actors mm. are the last to know freaking anything yeah ever and i don't know exactly why there's probably a lot of reasons one maybe because we're like little sensitive babies um and so you know last just tell us last and get it over and get out of here my guess Um, would be just speaking as a director and coming from it from that point of view kind of a thing yeah do you think that if you know it's coming it might somehow affect your performance Performance? of right like if you're because nobody walks around life every day going i'm gonna die tomorrow so here's how i'm gonna act right it's supposed to be unexpected so if you if the actor knows it's coming it may indeed affect how they change the performance of the of the character so i mean that's just my guess If, if that would be my my approach of not telling you <laughs> yes yes and, and you know of course you think about it like that and you're like yeah don't tell me but every actor is going to be like i'd be fine of That's course lie. yeah of course we're lying to you That's a lie. um but yeah fire country was amazing i mean max teria i shadowed him he directed the last episode of season one and i shadowed him on that episode and it was so awesome to see uh, someone work both sides like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. in general, being a number one is so hard. Being a director, you know, is like playing God. Oh, I mean, yeah. You have to have like this bird's eye view of understand. Like it is insanity. Um, and to do both at the same time is like basically being an alien. Yeah, without that. So <clears throat> I learned a lot on that show. And those that that's a, that's a good group of people. Shout out Diane Farr, who's basically my big sister for life. Yes. I love that. Mm. I love that. Yeah. Oh, but I mean, there, you've tried so many different things. You've been able to experience so many different things in the entertainment industry. And, you know, since we're having this conversation interviewing you, the tables used to be flipped. You used to be kind of like a talk show host. So, I mean, how 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 does that happen? How do you transition from that into being this amazing actress now? So, like, and how would you prepare and all of these different things? Because we went back and watched some of your clips and they're pretty <laughs> funny. You're pretty great. So, I mean, do you ever miss interviewing yes, people? Do you ever miss you being started, on that side of the couch? You started the question. I was like, which I miss, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's interesting. As I've become more successful as an actor, especially in television, you know, mm-hmm. film is a lot different and theater is even more different. But I'm having to learn to be my more myself all the time. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, there's there's Daniel Day Lewis stuff where you're transforming into this other thing, um, and then there's you know kind of procedural day to day stuff where you, honestly it's it's about making these words that are almost inaccessible. You know, we're giving you so much exposition 
um, to tell you this story about the guy who killed the woman and how we're trying to find her, but she was poisoned. Da, da, da. You know, like yeah. there's all this exposition that in order to get it across to the audience in a way that doesn't feel like they're being told exposition, right. you have to make it as natural as possible, which means making it as us as possible. So to answer your question, I feel like what um, what hosting did for me was made me become more me mm. and to stop really getting so concerned with like how the character would do something and then just be like, just say it. Yes. Don't, just say it and make it, it does it feel honest? Just then say the damn line. Yes. Because with Get It Girl, you know, we would have teleprompter stuff and, and they would give us some prompt and some brief that we had to follow. But mostly it was like, just be yourself and have a good time and listen. That's right. <laughs> and so, I, you know, that's what you guys do every day too. So it's funny how so many people are like, I could never act. And I'm like, you probably could. Yeah. Actually, you know, maybe, maybe doing Shakespeare is a little bit of a different niche, but in general, like, listen, be you. Yeah. If you can memorize lines, like it, it, it really, it does compact into something as basic as that, I think. And, um, well, and I hope if that gives people some uh, confidence to think that they can do. So, so listen. This this podcast is specifically geared towards up and comers and people trying to break into the industry, and we talk about that all of the time. And in fact, what you were just saying, I was applauding because it, it it's so dynamic in both of what uh, both on our podcast side and as filmmakers. Because if you go back and listen to our first few episodes of this show. It was very scripted and very just like it was on a timeline and where you had to hit the end of the block. It was yeah. awful. It was aw- – and we were like, this sucks. <laughs> we, we just need to be us. We need to be conversational. We just need to have a mm-hmm. good time. And and then it just blew up. You know, we haven't been around for seven years because it sucks. You know, it, it, it's right, – we've been right. around seven years. But it, it took us to figure out – people don't want to hear that. They want to just have us have fun and feel like they're yeah. in the room with us and having a good time. Yeah. And yeah. as directors – We approach our casting and when we get on set, we're very actor friendly because I'm that same way of what you just said. I said, listen, I don't want you to be such and such playing such and such. I want the character to be you. If this line doesn't seem natural to you, say it how you would say it because it's going to come across as unnatural if it's something you wouldn't say. So just I'm, I'm very loose. I'm very like if you don't change the scene. If you don't change what the scene is trying to say, I don't give a crap about the locked to the dialogue. Deliver it the way you would deliver it as if this was you and you were going through this conversation because that's real. And that is what's going to connect to the audience. That's how you make that connection to the audience. And I love that you brought that up because I think it's so critically important to, to understand that, yeah, it's acting, but it's also real because you probably right, know somebody right. that's gone through that or, or you've gone through that. or And the more of that that you can bring to it, the more connectability right. there is to the audience. So I, I think a lot of the time breaking in to the industry requires that specific skill. Mm. Now, obviously, whenever we're moving on to other roles and we're getting, I mean, I, I would love to play characters that are so, so, so different from me that I have to do the research and I have to do interviews and I have to dig down and create parts of me that weren't there. Like, of course, artistically right. and creatively, yes, I want to do that. But I don't think that we as actors get the opportunity to get to that place to create in that uh, layered depth until we are able just to do us because i mean you look at every freaking star on the planet and they became a star because of what they brought mm-hmm. not because they turned themselves into something else mm. um if anything they had something deep deep inside them that they needed to bring out yeah as opposed to create out of thin air um and i and i i have a lot of friends that are some of the most talented phenomenal actors that you know london theater trained 48 hour improv like these people are just so talented and when they get an audition they're like okay i can do this and i'm done and i'm like just say the fucking line <laughs> exactly <Throw it> away, <laughs> say the line be you who gives a shit and also the script may be written a certain way and that may not be you and what i say to my mates i'm like if that's not you, don't try and be that. 
Yes. Don't exactly. book this role. Use this as an opportunity to do this the way you would do it, and you probably won't book this role. But that casting director is going to go, holy shit, look at that guy. Well, he's not right for this, but he's perfect for that thing. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, I, I, I do think I agree with you. It's just like finding what's comfortable to you, natural to you. You're good enough. You're more than enough. Don't be anything else than you. That's right. And, Logan, I know you're jumping. I just – one more thing because to take it way back to what you just said about your reputation – about how you oh. are, how you are on set, how you're grateful to be there. That's the other thing. I think a lot of people that aren't in the industry yet don't realize how small the community actually is. Everybody knows everybody, and so your reputation, if you if it gets out that you're stellar to work with and you're a real gem of a human being and people like you and ever that's you. That's you. That's who everybody knows you. But on the flip side of that, if you're a pain in the ass and you're ungrateful and you think you're better than everybody and you're a real asshole, that's who you are. And it gets real quick. You, be, I think people don't understand how quickly that spreads as to who you yeah. are. So I love that yeah. you brought that up too because it's so critically important to know that no matter if you're – that extra on a set or if you're number one on the call sheet you better be acting the same way because at some point yes. you're not always number one on the call sheet yeah. you're gonna come back down at some point and those people that yeah. you passed up and treated like shit might be the people that need to hire you one day <laughs> and and they so you better be shit. real smart yeah. about how you're treating people because yeah. but there's also a middle ground because i do know some people um who they know this and so they go above and beyond um, to be super nice to everybody to where it's almost not uh, authentic. Oh, they're, they're, yeah. And there's there's a desperation there that um, my partner and I talk about this a lot because he – he's going to be so pissed that I say this. But he never wants anyone to think he's an asshole. Mm. Um, he's a cis hetero white male as well. So, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, he really, really doesn't want to make – he wants no one to think he's an asshole. And I was like, well, babe, are you an asshole? <laughs> and he was like, no, of course not. And I'm like, then fuck anyone who thinks you're an asshole. That's right. So, like, you don't have to go around trying to prove to people that you're nice if you're just nice. Nice. Exactly. And exactly. nice people can have bad days. Yep. And nice people can lose their cool. And, not, you know, I think there has to be some kind of grace given for that. Without doubt. Anybody that, you know, holds a grudge. But I think that comes across and that's – there's something about a confidence of knowing yourself in that regard too. Like I think that I'm a genuinely grateful and nice human being and I also can say things in a way where I sound like a total bitch <laughs> and I don't mean it. And yeah. I think that the people that know me know that and they're like, oh, OK. That was a little – don't talk to me like that. And I'm like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> right. So, you know, there is a middle ground between there is. like – yeah, just are you an asshole? Well, don't be one. <laughs> be a little spicy sometimes. That's right. That's yeah. right. Spicy. It's fine. It's fine. I love it. I love it. Well, something else we're trying out in 2024 is a great way to end our interviews, and we call them our popcorn questions. <laughs> Uh, uh -oh. They're a little fun. Um, they may make you, you know, go back in your memory bank and try to uh, think about some things. But I like them. I like them. And I mean, so far we've gotten positive reviews, positive reviews, and some interesting <laughs> but, uh, answers. <laughs> for sure, uh -oh. for sure. Um, but the first one is: What was the funniest moment or most memorable moment on the tracker set? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I know. And like, I don't want to like leave too much empty space here. We're in a podcast. Everyone's like, doo, doo, doo. you're good. It's an edited podcast. It, that's right. We edit. Oh, you're good to go, yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> Thank <All> you. Right. <laughs> the funniest and or most memorable moments. Gosh, it's funny because it, it, it feels all kind of like a blur. Um, and I probably have funnier moments or mo more memorable moments, but the one thing that just sticks out to me right now is that uh, we shot episode five in negative 11 degree weather. Um, I have never been so cold in my life. <laughs> Uh, and we were shooting outside. There was a parking lot. Episode five has come out. There's a parking lot scene where I'm leaving the courthouse and this guy named Lutro comes and kidnaps me. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, the costume department said, hey, do you want to wear some gloves? And I said, no, I'm on the phone coming out of the courthouse. That wouldn't make any sense. I would, I would be putting them on, fumbling. It wouldn't make, logically, it wouldn't make any sense. So I'm going to pass on the gloves. By take two or take three, I was like, I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> Fuck logic. <laughs> Who cares about what's logical? <laughs> I should have chose to have gloves. And I think about that now all the time because <laughs> Ethan Hawke does this interview where he's like, we're the logic police. Like the actor's job is to go, no, that wouldn't be real. The character wouldn't do that. It doesn't feel natural. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel normal. And then there's just like, put on the fucking gloves. It's <laughs> negative 11 degrees outside. <laughs> That's right. You know That's what right. I mean? Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's such a weird thing where, you, you know, as an artist, you're like, of course I would. It's all for the art. And then you're like. <laughs> Fuck all that. That's right. <laughs> That's when the money people go, you can't get sick and have to throw off the shooting schedule. You got to be exactly. here every day. Put the damn gloves if on. I lose my fingers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, Rini can't take phone calls. That's right. Okay. That's so, right. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I won't forget that. I think about it all the time. Uh, oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's let's give you another one. So we're going to go from, like, really lighthearted and kind of stuff, and then we just go deep into the Barbara Wawa uh, make you favorite, cry moment. My favorite place um, to be. So if you could go back and tell your 10-year-old self anything, a piece of advice, something that you would want her to know, what would you tell her? I talk to little me a lot, actually. I love that. Um, especially if I have moments of I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. I close my eyes. I try to feel my own heartbeat. And I say, hey, little Fiona, how do you want to feel? And she usually answers back. If I could tell her something now that I've known up until 36 years old, I would probably say slow down. There's no rush and everything that is meant for you will come to you. Mm. You don't have to go searching for it all the time. Um, And also there's no such thing as cool. (laughs) There you go. There you go. There's, you just don't even worry about being cool. It doesn't exist. No such thing. Slow down, have fun. And there's no such thing as cool. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's what love I that. Tell her. I that's love that. Great. I don't know about y'all, but I feel like the the temperature in the room just changed. Yeah, I just gloves, I mean, okay, I need some gloves. Yeah, Where yeah, are my gloves. Yeah, like, yeah, and for and forget like, editing like, that out. Right, forget editing that out, Logan. Right, that's a very dramatic pause, a very deep yeah, reflection. Man, you, right, the look on your like, face, you could just tell you were going deep into a reflective <laughs> moment. Yeah. I'm like, that's got to be left in right there. The audience could like, suffer <laughs> through the moment of silence right there on the listening exactly. side because the video side's gonna love it. <laughs> Oh, thank you guys. I really appreciate you just like willing to jump in and chat. These are my favorite moments. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And the final question of the entire interview, obviously Ooh. before promoting social media and things like that. Um, of course, of course. Are you happy with your career so far? I'm the luckiest bird in the world. <laughs> I really am. And I know it's going to change up and down and it's, it got here a lot later than I thought it was going to. Um, and none of it matters. I, mm. I feel like the luckiest girl in the world. So to answer your question, hell yeah, I'm happy. <sighs> Love it. Love it. <laughs> That is fantastic. Oh, my goodness. Well, listen, thank you so much for Thank coming you. on the show and getting crazy with us. Uh, it is yes, amazing. and congratulations <laughs> to <laughs> both of you. you. Thank officially you. Officially family right. now. Yes, yeah. Family. It's just the paperwork now. He's I, I, I've been yeah. calling him the son yeah. for like six years, you know. We just yeah, made it official now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. I had a blast. I had an absolute blast. Of course, blast. of course. Well, you know, it's all about social media now, so where can people follow you? Fiona Renee is literally my handle on everything and anything. Um, my dad made sure I got that real early. So thanks, dad. 
Um, so yeah, Fiona <laughs> Renee on everything. Um, and I don't ever use Facebook, so I apologize. But I'm not bad with Instagram. Could be better. Yeah, yeah. I think you're pretty good. Yeah, I, I no, yeah. Just a little follow on the feed. I, yeah, I you're pretty you're pretty good. good. You got it. You got it. You're better than me. <laughs> you. right, so there you go. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Uh, um, that's so, so yeah. Funny. Also, so open invite because you've one, you've just been an absolute gem to talk to. And, and, and I think that we could just keep talking for hours because you're so easy to talk to and so enjoyable. Um, and we didn't even scratch it. You know, there was a great thing that I saw you say that I would really love to readdress, maybe even on the mental health podcast about how you talk about when you came back from Europe and you had lost your uh, mother and you were having to learn how to deal with grief and love at the same time. How do I deal with this yeah. loss, but then learn to deal with I'm in this new city with this new career and everything is different. Yeah. I would really love to talk about that at, at, at some point with yeah. you because I think that's just beautiful. I think that would be such a conversation to have. And glory well, days. When season two. Yes. Oh, glory days. We didn't even talk about your glory days. I loved that on Lincoln Lawyer. So we got to have you back to talk about that as well. Like, oh my goodness, right? Like we well, opened the show talking three. about your horizontal. We didn't even go to the sex worker role. <laughs> like what the hell? <laughs> uh, epic fail. No. <laughs> um, but season three of Netflix is come or of Lincoln Lawyer is coming out on Netflix. Yes. I want to say at the end of the year, I, I can't, I don't know exactly the date, but it's coming. Yes. Um, and we got renewed for a season two of Tracker, Yes. Um, which we'll probably start shooting in July. So once, you know, it'll be a perfect excuse for us to come back and Absolutely. meet again. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. Time flies when you're having fun. That's I sure. agree. That's I agree. Sure. This is a blast and super <laughs> easy. So thank you guys so much. Of course. Of course. Of course. Everybody be sure to check out Tracker on CBS and Paramount Plus. And Fiona, thank you again so much for coming on the show. Yeah. Have a great rest of your evening and we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you. Bye, 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 bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. That is a great first interview after our break. Man. Yes. I just, wow. That was phenomenal. We really could have talked to her forever. She's in that handful to where the conversation just kept going. Yeah. It, it, it felt so like we've known her forever. It felt like we've known her for years and she's just a part of the family. And we're like, oh, right. my gosh. And so impressive. I love just the way her approaches to everything that she does, whether it's a recurring role or a starring role or whether she's dealing with life and bullying. It's just what an inspirational interview for anybody out there going, you know what, whatever you're kind of going through. You got this. You're going to be okay, and you're still going to be excel and live life great. And uh, just, I love conversations like that, man. Yes, for sure, for sure. Well, thank you again, Fiona, for coming on the show. All right, now it is time for the top five segment, man. And this week, like Dustin said earlier in the show, it is top five films that redefined the blockbuster movie at the theaters. Yes. Man, oh, man. I mean... When you think about the word blockbuster and what that means and how many different films are considered blockbusters, it's a lot, man. It's a lot of good movies that not only changed Hollywood as far as revenue, but they also changed cinema overall, right? Uh, without doubt. Without doubt. As we're speaking right now, I noticed that we have one that's the same. And I'm going to change mine because mm. one just popped into my head that absolutely redefined Blockbuster. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to put it on there and I don't I can't believe I didn't have it on there. But anyway, okay. Yeah, you're right. It it, it just seems like what defines game-changing have to see tentpole movies that people consider blockbusters and this is what we're going to discuss now and it's interesting because we have some some interesting picks you know very very old school very new and it's a nice little blend this is gonna be fun yeah i completely agree i completely agree well, number five for me goes to the entire Avatar franchise. I felt like I was going to get a little pushback on this one, but you know. I felt like what they were able to do with the technology for the first one definitely elevated everybody else's game when it came to storytelling and filmmaking. And I mean, we've seen what cinema and CGI can be nowadays. And I mean, what they were able to do back when this 
first film came out. Um, I don't necessarily think the second one lived up to the hype and the technology versatile versatility that the first one did. Um, but I personally still enjoy the story. I honestly like the second one story better than the first one. Um, but I thought what the Avatar franchise did for Hollywood in the entertainment industry was something monumental. That's for sure. And I mean, it's still the highest grossing movie of all time. Um, with a couple different ones that are on our list right behind it. Um, but what James Cameron was able to do is remarkable, even if he's kind of an asshole. Um, but yeah, I thought it was only right that we, one of us, probably me more than you, uh, put it on my list because like I said, I mean, I enjoy the films and I think what the technology did for Hollywood was monumental. So yeah, the Avatar franchise. Well, look, I've got Cameron on my list too with one that also was te game-changing technology. Nobody had seen it before what he did in this movie. So he's 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 he does that. He comes up with game-changing technology and on-screen effects that people haven't seen before he does it. So the only problem I have with him is yeah, it's the highest-grossing movie of all time because he re-released it four fucking times. I I just don't That's think re-releases should count towards the initial take it should be like your initial right. run should be your number and and you sh your re-releases shouldn't count and that, that's just my opinion that's what i all right my number five is the first that's right there was no such thing as a summer blockbuster before this film this is the first one that was termed blockbuster it was the first movie to get the coin. A press guy came out, called it that. So game changer. From now on, every movie had to be a blockbuster. I am talking about Jaws. Dun, dun, dun. Changed the fucking game. This movie had people fucking terrified, but it had them in droves going to the theaters to see it. They wouldn't go to the fucking water anymore, but they were going to the theaters to see it. And... It had never been done before. It No kind of a movie had this type of a phenomenon before where it, everybody in the country had to see it. Everybody had to go. Uh, people were going two, three, four, five times. This is the first movie to make that happen. And it's, of course, Spielberg. Of course it is. But um, Jaws, it, it, it is the granddaddy of summer blockbusters. And without Jaws, none of the rest of these films on our list exist. <coughs> there's no term bl blockbuster so congratulations steven spielberg congratulations jaws and uh yeah <laughs> i still watch it man and it still terrifies me i'm still nervous to get in the water after it fuck that's funny yeah, i haven't <coughs> seen it yet but um on my upcoming off days i'm hoping to uh finally watch it i know i still haven't seen it i've seen we've seen the actual shark at the um the academy museum out in la but that's <laughs> a big fucking robot thing. no cgi y'all they yeah. built this motherfucker and it broke down a ton of times there was yeah. a lot of problems of on times. that set so, you know, I mean, Jaws gave him a motherfucking nightmare. He, even the fake one was giving him nightmares. But, uh, yeah, man, it's a, it's a great film. I can't wait for you to watch it so we can talk about it. For sure, for sure. Well, number four for me brought the theaters and blockbusters back to life after a worldwide pandemic. Mm. I'm talking about Top Gun Maverick. Definitely, definitely, definitely one of those sequels that is better than the original, in my opinion. And I feel like a lot of people's opinions. Um, but I feel like what Top Gun Maverick was able to do was able to bring that sense of community back to the theater for those who were scared to go back after the pandemic. And I mean, it was I, because they never really kind of clarified when the end of the pandemic was. So it was like kind of sort of during, but towards the back half, whatever. But still, a lot of people hadn't seen movies in the movie theaters yeah. in more than two years until Top Gun Maverick. And I mean, it's so special. It's one of those that has an amazing rewatch value. That's why I like it so much because you can literally flip it on at any point in time. And there's so many different aspects in the film that are brilliant. Um, but what it was able to do for Hollywood and for the theater chain specifically was bring a dead man back to life 
basically. Um, so thank you, Tom Cruise. Um, we 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 put one on the board for Scientology, um, <laughs> but you know it's uh, it's one of those things where. <laughs> You can't not acknowledge the greatness that is Tom Cruise and Top Gun Maverick because it it did really I don't want to say save but it it really put Hollywood on its shoulders for that back half of the year. Um, so I I had to put it on there. Top Gun Maverick, man. No, oh, absolutely, and he made it a, a point of telling the studio it would not happen unless they guaranteed a theatrical release. He said this movie is made for yeah. the theaters, and it's the only way I'm doing it. And so good for him for sticking to it because it did start the resurgence of what we ended up seeing of what what I've got on my list. And so, um, yeah, yeah, my number four. Another game changer, guys. This is, keep in mind, this is before the massive cineplexes, okay? We didn't have 10, 15, 20 screens in a theater. We had max, you had like four, okay? This movie was, it came out of the gate. It made more money in its opening weekend than any movie ever. It was the biggest opening weekend, okay? And it had people literally lined up around buildings, blocks long, trying to get in to see it. I'm talking about Batman, 1989, Keaton. Mm. It was a massive phenomenon. All across the country, people were in lines, like, like literally blocks long or wrapped around the building. Everybody in costume, everybody like, I don't know if it was, we were finally going to see the Dark Knight and not campy like the 1960s. I don't know if it was people's fascination with seeing a comedian play the role of a Dark Knight and how would Keaton do. There was so much interest and talk and controversy about it. I think that no doubt led to people going to see it but then the rewatch value was just massive this thing was people were going to see it four five six seven times and and it was incredible and like i said it was the largest opening movie opening weekend up to that point ever and people thought holy shit a movie can make this much money in three days like whoa um and so yeah kind of redefined the game again and it it kick-started it restarted superhero movies because they kind of died after superman was like whoa but by the time we got superman three and four that shit fucking sucked and people were over it they're like we, we don't really care we don't super superhero movies suck we don't want to see them but batman launched it again after batman everybody wanted to make fucking superhero movies again and and so you got to credit him for not only like resurging the box office and redefining blockbusters but basically re-kicking restarting superhero franchises so there you go my number four batman 89 nice nice that's freaking awesome um well another freaking james cameron one that we i mean have to put on our list because i mean i love leonardo dicaprio of course he was big in um <laughs> what's it called what's eating gilbert grape yeah um but this one this one right here, I felt like really put him on the map to be that leading man, to be that guy. And it's that near, far, <laughs> wherever you are. I'm king of the world. Hold me, Jack. That's right. Titanic. Yes, that one. Um, I still haven't seen it in its entirety. I've seen it so chopped up what? so many times, but I've never seen it in its entirety ever, which is crazy because, like I said, Leo, my guy. Um, but, yeah, I feel like what Titanic was able to do was kind of uh, pump some life back into the blockbusters in a new way, in the sense of storytelling, where they don't have to be these big uh i get uh, historical events i guess i uh, it it brought blockbusters back to historical events that's what i should say um so to be able to do that where it's wrapped around this historical event but then they turn it into a love story was very interesting um so yeah number three for me titanic look that movie was the biggest movie of all time biggest money-making movie of all time and and it did it with out re-releases at first he's since re-released it a gazillion times <laughs> but course. at first and please our, all of our watchers or listeners out there correct me if i'm wrong but if i'm not mistaken it holds the record for the longest initial box office run 
It was in theaters, I mm-hmm. felt like, for fucking years. Obviously not years, but it was like... It was. It just kept going and going and going. It's like it's still in theaters. It's still in there. It was forever. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it holds the record for the longest initial box office run. And listen, I know I give you know Cameron a lot of crap and it, you knock him or whatever, but you have to be a really good fucking filmmaker to have people go see your movie multiple times when you know how it ends. There's no there's yeah. no suspense for Titanic. We all fucking know what happened. But people were still glued to the fucking chairs watching that thing till the very end over and over and over and over. So there's a handful of filmmakers that I know that can do that and and make people, you know, and one of another one's on my list at number 1. But another one that got off the top of my mind was Spielberg when he did Lincoln. Is the vote going to pass? Is slavery going to end? You know how it fucking ends, but he had you like wondering, is it going to pass? Oh my God, are they going to like... It's a handful of people that can do it. And Cameron is one of those people. He did it with Titanic and... So, and that's why I'm going to put him on my list at my number three, because this one did indeed redefine the blockbuster once again with catchy phrases and, and uh, just all kinds of stuff. Terminator 2 judgment day and again it took the special effects and the cgi to a whole new fucking level whole new level now we've got the liquid terminator right robert patrick and that badass kind of a thing i mean it was just stuff we had never seen before on on film like how is he do this is incredible what are we looking at right here it was one of those over the top huge in your face action films with technology you had never seen before, and it was, as Arnold called it back then, the biggest movie of the summer. They kept billing it as the biggest movie of the summer. And it did. It became the biggest movie of the summer, and again, redefined blockbusters. It's like, and it set the bar. Okay, here's where we're at. You got to have this much action, and you got to have this much, like, special effects. And I, boom, can you make those special effects? Can you get what I did kind of a thing? He just redefined how you do it and everybody since has been trying to up the game with the cgi and making the special effects and so i give it to him man terminator 2 judgment day it was badass film for sure for sure um number two for me goes to 10 years worth of storytelling Mm. 10 years of building up this story with so many beautiful amazing badass characters and what I still say is the peak of the MCU is the Avengers Endgame. Mm. This film, I mean, of course, it broke the weekend box office. It, for a period of time, held the highest grossing movie of all time. And I mean, what they were able to do is so freaking crazy, man. And I mean, sp- talk about rewatch value. You can rewatch yeah. this three hour film so many times. Yeah. I mean, how many times do you see since this film's release for December 31st at a certain time you can start it? And then when Iron Man snaps his fingers, that's when it's the next year. People do that every single year. They literally started a tradition where people bring in the new year by watching Avengers Endgame, which I think is so freaking awesome. Um, But, I mean, it's still one of my all-time favorite films of all time. Um, It's beautiful, and what they were able to do over that 10 years. Um, Do you remember how many movies were released in that 10 years? Oh, my gosh. If... uh... If you gave me a minute, I could count them because I know every one in those phases that led up to Endgame. I know every single one of them. So if you gave me a minute, I could count and tell you. Um, But you're right. right? You know, and if they just re-released this for a couple of weeks, it would take number one again. Because it's it's like right Right. there, right? Like just, well, fuck it. Why not? Everybody else just re-release Endgame and get back to the number biggest movie of all time. I don't think the record will ever be broken for the biggest opening weekend, though. This thing fucking just... No, I don't think so. It said it so fucking high. Well over $300 million in its opening weekend. Fucking insane numbers. Yeah, Uh, yeah, it was insane. 352, 351. Yeah, I don't think that will ever be beat. I, I, I just, I think that's a bar that can't be topped. 
dropped. Um, but I'm right there with you, man. And so many iconic moments. I mean, when the hammer comes flying into in the cap's hand, and you fucking hell yeah, because he's worthy, motherfucker. And then you hear on your left, and here <laughs> they all come, and Avengers assemble. I mean, it's a fucking epic. I mean, it's just or 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 Peter saying, "I don't want to die," kind of a you know, like in in yeah. uh, in Infinity War, and it, that whole saga was just. I don't know, man. I'm right. To, I, I get it. Endgame just, whoo, whoo. It gives me chills just thinking about that moments. scene, like, bro. <laughs> that that, that I, I would watch that scene every day, all day, all the time. It's so fucking epic. Right. Um, now, my number two, speaking of the 351 whatever fucking million dollars, right, opening weekend. There's another little superhero film that set the bar. If this is how it redefined summer blockbusters... It is the first film to ever open at a hundred million dollars for the opening weekend. First film to ever do it, and if I'm not mistaken, it was like a hundred and twelve million dollars. Unheard of. No fucking way ever you're gonna make a hundred million dollars in three days. Well, this one did. Spider Man, OG Spider Man, Tobey Maguire, Kirsten Dunst. Hundred and twelve million dollars. Unheard of. Nobody had ever seen a movie like that before. Ever. Batman, when I talk about Batman 89, 80 something million people thought never gonna be done again. Nobody can ever fucking match it. Well, another superhero did. Spider Man beat it. 100 and something million dollars. 112, 114 million dollars. Um, I mean, and this thing, the momentum that it had to open like that, because unfortunately, guys, they released the first trailer for it. They had to go back and remove the trailer almost immediately because the trailer pictured this image of a helicopter being caught in spider-man's web in between the world trade towers and it and then the towers got hit and they came down and they're like fuck we can't and they had to go back and edit out the towers in the film not just that scene but edit out anytime you would see him going through the city they had to edit out it was a highly like oh fuck what do we do now kind of a thing but it didn't stop people from going it didn't stop people from like the fascination of and um yeah man again like just changed the game 100 million and now that's the bar let's be honest about it spider-man is the bar because we're never going to get another 300 but now if you don't open at 100 million dollars you're considered a flop i mean if people are opening at 60 million 70 million you're like oh it's a fucking failure it's a flop what because spider-man set that bar studios literally think now 100 million or it's not worth it and i'm just like that is insane to me that is insane to me but there you go the reason being my number two, Spider Man. Yeah, 114. 114. Yep, almost I knew. 115. Yeah. Uh, that's what it was at. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's super crazy because you're right. It all depends on production budget. Oh, and, yeah. And that's why they always say horror films are the sure thing because horror films, yeah. if all the, the regular people out there don't know, horror films are really cheap to make. Um, all that stuff is super, super easy compared to all the CGI and everything yep. like that. Um, honorable mention, I do want to put the first Avengers because that's the first one that broke 200, 200 million. million. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. You, you see a trend. You see a trend. Um, but let's just give it to I Stan Lee, bro. <laughs> literally. Marvel characters like, are like 100 he, million, he 200 million, yeah. 300 million. And if it is ever going to be broken, it's going to be a fucking Marvel movie that hits 400 million. Yeah. I just feel like that's going to be happening. Like, you know. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. But I think, um, you know, the success of Spider-Man was huge. But by the time we got to the third one, things were a little rocky. Yeah. Right? I yeah. mean, compared to what the first two films did, the first two Tobey Maguire films, three was not great. No. I mean, let's be honest about it. And I mean, the numbers showed, that's for sure. So people were a little wishy-washy when it came to superhero films. You had a couple of uh, Hulk movies that came out with Edward Norton and the other guy. Uh, um, But I feel like, you know, what... People really didn't have a lot of faith in superhero movies anymore. So what? When it comes to 2008, when Iron Man was released by Paramount... Yep. um, That sparked new life in fans to where okay, we can start believing in superhero movies again. And I feel like that's exactly what happened because Robert Downey Jr., Kevin Feige, and John Favreau 
they completely reinvented and redefined blockbuster for the foreseeable future to where we're at now today um but that also leads into your number one but yeah i feel like what they were able to do with the first initial iron man to uh, have people have faith in superhero movies again was unmatched undefined everyone talks about that movie all the time because it's it's a classic now yeah it really is it's one of those that people can throw on at any point in time and it it makes you nostalgic and it makes you feel like that you're you're starting that 10 years over again yeah and you can go through that first um infinity saga as uh, they like to call it but yeah number one for me iron man i feel like they redefined the blockbuster genre oh without doubt and it's so funny because our list is full of what like so like i said 1978 superman right that's what launched Mm -hmm. like oh everybody wants to do superhero movies now and then it kind of died batman 89 Mm -hmm. resurged it and then it kind of died spider-man resurged it and then it kind of died iron man resurged it so it's funny that they just like every few years it's like okay now we're gonna try again and we're gonna make these awesome things but yeah iron man launched obviously like and it will never be mad nobody is ever going to match the franchise success of the mcu it is never going to happen people have tried ever since and they have failed miserably nobody is ever going to be able to duplicate what they were able to do and if it isn't favreau demanding that it's that it's robert downey jr paramount wanted the golden boy tom cruise that's their golden boy that was who they wanted and and favreau's like then i'm not your fucking guy i'm the, it's robert downey jr or bust and it's fucking and feige went to bat and the rest is history guys i mean fuck but there is a little fade there is a little are people getting tired and we've we're seeing a resurgence now of a genre that did go almost completely away at the box office. People were never going. I sat in so many of these type movies in theaters by myself because nobody would go fucking see them. And then this movie changed the game. This movie brought it back and said, we can make a summer blockbuster that's full dialogue, full drama, no special effects, no fucking anything. It's just people talking, heavy hardcore, and it's going to make a billion dollars. And it did. Oppenheimer. Holy shit. Redefined the game because it didn't. I mean, you had the one big explosion. Obviously, everybody knew it was coming. We knew how that that was going to go. But other than that, it is a story driven, dialogue driven film from start to finish. And it made a billion dollars. People were packing out theaters and, and going to see it more than once, twice, three times in conjunction with Barbie. And, and so mm-hmm. you got to say it redefined the blockbuster because this is a whole different type of blockbuster that, that you just don't picture when you say tentpole film. You don't picture that. You don't picture drama-driven dialogue films. That's just not what you think. And Christopher Nolan said, now you do. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and there you go. That's just the brilliance of his filmmaking and, and the cast he assembled. John Papsadera, our buddy, should have got an Oscar for that fucking shit. Um, it's just amazing. Oppenheimer, my number one. Redefined, once again, the blockbuster for her. I mean, it's just incredible. It's incredible. Well, it is interesting, too, because, like, yeah, through going through our list and, like, divvying up everything, it. It's like that for every genre, it seems, it is. right? Like, I mean, Titanic and Oppenheimer, the historical factor. Right. But then it does have a dip, and it, it does come like a half a resurgence, yep. just like superhero movies. That, that's very interesting. It always comes back around. Yeah. All, mm, interesting. Like, light bulb moment right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, yeah, guys, what is your favorite blockbuster that you think redefined the movie industry, or what's your favorite blockbuster overall? We want to know. Be sure to comment below in the comment section. And, of course, at us on X or Threads. We love the fan interaction. Um, so be sure to do that, man. That mm, Great one. Oh, great my gosh. Such a great five. list, man. Um, 
All right. <laughs> well, we're heading over to the box office recap to round out the show. Godzilla X Kong The New Empire came in at number one with $31.2 million. Monkey Man came in at number two with $10 million. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire came in at number three with $9 million. The First Omen with $8.3 million at number four. And Kung Fu Panda 4 at number five. Yes. $7.7 .7 million. Um, new movies that are coming out this week: Civil War. Oh yeah, this is one that I really want to. Uh, me too. See. That's going to be the number uh, one movie. Jesse Plemons, like, yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it's going to be amazing. Even more so. I was listening to an entertainment-based podcast. Sorry, sidebar. I was listening to my entertainment-based podcast, and they had the CEO of IMAX on there. And Civil War is one that's going to be released in IMAX. Which yeah. is so crazy when you think about. Like, all of these studios, they have to pitch their film to IMAX to see which ones they want to show. So that's uh, so interesting. This but anyway, movie, yeah. Um, yes, go. It's terrifying because I think the, the, the buzz about it and everybody wanting to see it is because how far are off we it from this? <laughs> exactly. We're, like, right around yeah. the corner from this actually being reality. And I think that's what everybody's going to go see. They're like, uh... Fuck! <laughs> like, I mean, well, yeah, you know what? I put it. I put it in the same vein. Obviously, not as extreme. So don't like come at me. Don't quote it. Don't none of that stuff. Not in the same like you know concept racially, but it's in the same vein as Birth of a Nation. Um, so I mean, to do a radical look at society and the, the possibilities of what could be, it's going to be very interesting to see the reactions of it and see if people are either like they like get more hostile or they dial it back but with the upcoming election year i'm only expecting them to get more hostile oh, yeah. so um it's going to be interesting it's going to be interesting um another movie coming out arcadian another one is don't tell mom the babysitter's dead um, number another one is Sting and The Long Game. So be sure to check out those movies in select theaters near you. Just like these as well. Arthur the King, Dune Part 2, Immaculate, um, Kung Fu Panda 4, The First Omen, of course, and then the, all the ones that I have listed above. Exactly. But man, oh man, yeah, what a great weekend to be alive for Box Office. Yes. Um, and then, of course, headed over into the IMDb Pro's Top Trending segment. Uh, the top trending movie is Godzilla X Kong: The New Empire. The top trending TV show is Three Body Problem, and the top trending star is Isaiah Gonzalez, who we talked about in the industry news. So yep. she's killing it right now. So kudos to her, man. Kudos oh yeah. To her. Um, but anyway, guys, thank you so much for getting crazy with us on episode two. 256 of a calf podcast we got to thank our guest one more time fiona renee for coming on the show like we said be sure to check out cbs's tracker it's a great show you will definitely enjoy it and oh, you yeah. can follow her on social media at fiona renee most active on instagram yes and then of course you can follow us on social media the company is at crazy ant media where you can stay up to date with our film projects because we are filmmakers and then of course the podcast is at it calf podcast where you can stay up to date with all the entertainment based news and know when all of our new episodes come out with interviews with your favorite guest and then we also have our mental health podcast everything's okay that one just came out with a new episode last wednesday so be sure to check that out one that that one is about balance verse or with uh, work versus life so that is very interesting. So be sure to check that one out and uh, examine. Let us know what your thought process is. Do you balance work and home life very well? Well, we talk about all about our personal experiences with that. So yes. it's really good. It's really good. And, of course, be sure to follow us both personally on social media. Myself at J. Logan Austin and at Crazy Ant CEO. That's right. And be sure to subscribe to this podcast anywhere you listen to your podcast. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio, Podbean, Stitcher, YouTube Shorts, and our YouTube Music, and so much more. Like I said, if you're watching this video on YouTube, be sure to hit that like button below, subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell for all the latest and greatest notifications coming out of Crazy Ant Media. And of course, be sure to visit our website, www.crazyantmedia.com, where you can start rocking all the latest and greatest Crazy Ant Media gear. And you have to follow us at those accounts above just because that's when you know when the merchandise sales are going on. And 
I want to do this quick little run through because you brought it up during our top five segment, the longest um, tenure, the longest run in theater for films. And you'd actually be surprised. So um, Titanic is at number nine. Wow. Longest run. It, yeah, it's tied with Avatar. Um, so Avatar, the original longest weeks in theater was 54, of course, not re-releases. Um, number nine is Titanic, 54. Um, and then number eight was Beverly Hills Cops with 56, the original. Number seven was Back to the Future with 78 weeks. Number six was the original Jurassic Park with 81 weeks. Number five was E.T. the Extraterrestrial in uh, 1982 with 81 weeks. Number four was Gone with the Wind with 107 Well, weeks. yeah, yeah. Number, <laughs> number three was the rocky poor the rocky horror picture show with 118 weeks um number two was star wars episode four the new hope with 135 and number one with the longest initial run in theaters was the sound of music with 147 weeks wow wow so so classics though Right, like, like, yeah. like, it makes sense. It makes sense. But boy, it sure felt. Maybe it's just because the buzz about Titanic. Everybody was talking about it so much, That's like probably all the was, time. For sure. But any movie, that whole thing, all of them motherfuckers were in there for more than a year straight. Like that's like, yeah, you're were. lucky if you get three <laughs> weekends now. Fuck, not a whole fucking Literally. year. So I mean, you got to make all your money up front in the first weekend now because you're barely gonna get a second one lately. So to to think that they would stay in there for a, over a year is just insane that that's kudos to all those mo- i saw every one of those movies and i fucking loved all of them so and i even right? saw a few <laughs> most of them most of them in the theater there was a couple on that list yeah. that i did not see on their theatrical release because i was not born yet but you know right although logan <laughs> exactly. would beg to differ he probably thought i saw all I mean, of them you know, and yeah you know yeah. Gonna say anything that's right time. yeah I I, i'm the time. highlander i'm the real highlander i'm immortal i fucking saw gone with the wind when it came out in theaters like you know like, right <laughs> There's a reason I got the swords. Don't come at me. Don't come at me. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But man, oh man, I think we did really good this week because when CinemaCon started announcing things, we were like, holy crap, what are we going to do about this show? Oh, yeah. So I think the way we executed it was very well. Um, I'm very excited to see all of these things come to fruition. And uh, yeah, man, I mean, it's hard to narrow down a specific thing that I'm most excited for out of all that because there's so many different things that I feel like the studios are back to competing. So I'm excited to see what's going to happen. But I, like I said in a tweet today or a tweet yesterday because this comes out on Saturday, um, I think Warner Brothers is really – taking the helm of the blockbuster studio i think that's just what they're striving for right now would you agree or would you think disney is i think disney will reclaim the mantle i think disney yeah. dropped it for a little bit no doubt about it and, and and warner brothers and then even like this this past year universal picked it up but i think disney uh, the chapic years <laughs> <laughs> Fuck Chappic, bro. I, 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 Iger is going to reclaim the fucking throne. He's going to be like, remember when nobody could fucking touch us? We're back. And I think that's going to launch. I think Deadpool is going to do that. I think I think they're going to see a resurgence and, and reclaim that spot. But Warner Brothers will be, I, think you're, I, I don't think you're wrong. They're right there. They're right there. So we shall see. Well, I definitely feel like it won't happen until 2025 for Disney to reclaim the throne. That's for sure. Just because with Deadpool 3 being the only superhero movie coming out in 2024, which sucks. But we we, we get it. We get it. Um, but, I mean, one thing that's always consistent for <laughs> 256 episodes. Redefining it. That's right. Think it. Re- <laughs> we're redefining it every single week. We Positive affirmations with the one... The only Oprah! Oprah!